Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar on strategies for scaling up. Um, we've got quite a few people listening in so I think we're ready to kick off. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. I'm absolutely delighted that we have Fergus Lyon with us from the Centre for Enterprise and Economic Development Research at Middlesex University who's going to be leading the session today. Um, as always, we're recording the session, so you'll be able to listen again. We'll send you the link after the, afterwards, and we'll also share the slides with you. Now, Fergus is going to do the presentation, and then we can do a bit of a Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions, please type them in the, the question or chat box, um, and we'll be able to do a, a Q&A at the end. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over the controls to Fergus and in a few minutes you'll be able to hear his voice and see his screen. Hello. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Fergus Lyon. Uh, just, uh, as Julie just mentioned, I'm from the Middlesex University. Uh, I've also been part of the uh, Third Sector Research Centre, um, which was uh, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the Cabinet Office and the Barrow Cadbury Trust over the last uh, five or six years, uh, where I was leading the work on social enterprise. So I'm going to draw on a range of different projects that we have been doing over this time uh, and uh, doing uh, uh, some uh, work as well, more uh, directly with some organisations. Um, uh, we've been doing more sort of direct work with them. Um, so, the introduction really, what uh, we'll be looking at today, really what are the strategies for scaling, um, and then secondly, what are the challenges? And in this, I want to see this idea particularly about what is meant by, uh, what is meant by growth. Uh, and, uh, if I can just minimize this thing. I can't see my screen actually. Um, sorry. Uh, um, sorry um, that's better. Um, so what are the different approaches to growth adopted by social enterprises um, and uh, what are the missions and values that underpin them? Um, and then secondly I'm going to be looking at what are the resources and entrepreneurial capabilities uh, that are needed to, uh, to implement such strategies. But what I want to do as well is I want to challenge this idea of growth and also look what I refer to in the title is this idea of scaling. And I want to make a distinction here between what is meant by growth uh, and what is meant by scaling. So, um, right. Uh, so growth, really, you, people talk about growth particularly in terms of economic terms, uh, in terms of turnover of an organization, how much money it's uh, bringing in, or it could be seen in terms of its profits or surplus. Um, also people look at ideas of uh, sales or particularly look at the number of people employed. Um, or you can look at the market share, the, uh, the, so the amount of the, the market that the organization might be taking um, or just the physical output, you know, the number of services being provided or the number of people being supported as well. I think that distinction there, particularly when you get onto the number of people being supported, makes us really think what is the type of uh, growth and scaling up we want to look at. And as social enterprises, as our core uh, focus is on the social impact, it's really about how do you increase that social impact. And what I'm going to show later that one of the ways of growing that social impact is through growing the organization. Uh, I can show you that with a number of different examples. Um, but the other, there's other ways as well of uh, having a bigger impact um, uh, on a whole range of different uh, objectives that uh, an organization might be having. So it's all about looking at that scaling, um, and so it's looking at that social and environmental impact. How can you make it uh, wider, uh, supporting more people or greater uh, as environmental areas? Uh, or how do you make it deeper? How do you have more impact on those people you're already working with? And really, so really the asking for each uh, of, sort of when you're looking at uh, a strategy for an organization, whether it's your own or, other, or supporting other people, the question is, what's the best way to scale up? What's the best way of maximizing the social impact? Um, what are the different strategies you can use and what do you need to get there? So these are the things I'll be uh, covering uh, throughout this talk. So I'm going to talk 
we'll go straight into some of the cases that we'll be drawing on, and I'll come back to these cases as, we, as I talk uh, uh, later on uh, through different areas. But the first one I want to talk about is the London Early Years Foundation. This is an organization uh, we've been working with at Middlesex and the Third Sector Research Center over the last four or five years. And they're going through a period of, uh, of sustained growth, uh, and it's an interesting example. It's a, it's a successful social enterprise, started as a charity, but actually back uh, over 100 years ago, in about 1903, um, particularly looking at children's services in the London area, in Westminster. Um, and the interesting thing that they have developed over the time, they've, uh, as the organization has changed, they've moved into different markets. But most recently, in the last uh, few decades, they've been really focusing on the nursery provision and uh, other uh, early years, uh, other early years support. One of the most uh, sort of key aspects of what they're able to do is provide really high quality nurseries uh, um, in some of the most deprived areas, which wouldn't have, be having them otherwise. But also having other ways of doing it, by, such as having a socially inclusive fee structure so they can offer, um, uh, make it more affordable for people. Um, they're also able to sort of uh, have um, um, a degree of being flexibility, filling other gaps related to early years um, support. And they've got a strong uh, um, ethos of having community roots, of working with the local communities. And one of the examples of that is the uh, sort of their intergenerational programs. And they realize if you want to look at child poverty and look at the uh, livelihoods of children in the long run, you've got to look at their, uh, you know, what, what the relationships are with the parents and with the grandparents as well. And this all focuses down into their core provision, which is on um, uh, their, sort of, uh, their nurseries and the... Uh, the early years care they're providing there. Um, and then secondly, they've got a, a key role in doing various uh, training and qualifications that they're offering, and quite a large apprenticeship program as well. And so they're looking at how it's part of their ways of offering a better services uh, through training our people. Um, and then also they take a, a wider view looking at their uh, um, impact more broadly, particularly looking at their environmental impact and what they can do through their procurement. So that was, uh, that's one of the core cases I'll be looking at. When I want to look at these different strategies, what, I, what we did in this uh, small bit of work that we did is we looked at other types of early years providers, and that's the way we, uh, to, to sort of draw out the sort of different um, uh, comparisons with different uh, types of growth and different types of organizations. So we could compare this uh, early years foundation, London Early Years Foundation, um, with other types of nurseries. So with a couple of other cases we, uh, we looked at, which were more single-site, I call them single-site charity nurseries. Um, and they had some similarities, these two. And uh, they tend to be, uh, uh, just have a parent, the second case I'm looking at has a parent board of trustees. They do have some subsidized nursery places. Um, they have workshops with parents and off offering training as well. Um, but also operating at quite a small scale. Um, uh, but trying to develop different relationships with uh, community groups uh, and local businesses. The second one, uh, the, the third case I'm looking at here, I mean, is um, again has a, um, a management committee of parents and community uh, representatives. Shares very uh, many similarities to the to case two. Interesting distinction is that they also have an active marketing strategy to, to target lower income families. So going around uh, areas of concentrations, uh, whether it being um, of lower income families, leafleting them, trying to get them to use the, the, uh, the early years, um, the nursery and early years provision that they've got there as well. They also have a local recruitment policy of trying to get uh, local students in there. And again, they looking at sort of linking across the generations, particularly with, uh, and linking with other uh, with elderly care homes, um, but also look at linking with other parts of the education with other schools as well. And a fourth case just to look at here is a private childcare company with social aims. So this was a, um, it's a private limited company, so it's a privately owned nursery, but it had a core social aim. So in a way, you know, we, we weren't sort of uh, saying that uh, what the type of legal form that the organization has makes, uh, affects what they do, you can find um, a lot of organizations which um, have a private limited company. They may not have an asset lock or a, um, sort of controls on what they do with the profit that you might have, 
with a community interest company or a company limited by guarantee, but it has a, still has this core social aim. And this was a slightly larger organization. Uh, it had uh, seven nurseries um, and um, offering a wide range of other services such as holiday play clubs, after school clubs, um, and then had set up a spin-out organization as well, a sister organization offering training, uh, particularly on forest school for nursery children uh, and training to staff as well. So that uh, is a way of expanding their social impact through that. Um, they had cross-nursery subsidies. So in this way, they had, through having different nurseries, they were able to take the surplus for one nursery and use it to um, uh, uh, support less, uh, less profitable nurseries as well to, to keep them going. Um, and they had a policy of, uh, of inclusion in terms of you know, who, uh, they're, they're not wanting to exclude people based on price. Um, and then again, similar to the others, had a strong local employment ethos as well and strong links uh, with local schools. But this is uh, often being able to work at a different scale uh, to the, the, the single site nurseries, uh, but having the seven there. But again, we can compare that to the London Early Years Foundation, uh, which has at the latest count uh, um, 26 nurseries uh, across different parts of London, and very recently just announced uh, getting a, huge, a very large amount of uh, uh, funding uh, of loan finance to help it grow and almost double in size um, in, in future years as well. So I'll get on to this idea of growth, and I think, uh, uh, and sort of scaling up of the organization. But by looking at these different, these four different uh, organizations, representing different types of uh, social enterprises, um, we can see different strategies of what they've been uh, doing. So here we can list the, uh, the different strategies. Um, we've got, um, first of all, just maximizing the social impact of the provision, just doing what they do, but doing it very well, uh, helping, making sure that they're offering the best quality nursery provision. And this would be the same across any social enterprise of how it can maximize its social impact of what it's doing at the moment. Secondly, we found them having a strategy of diversification. Uh, so case one, Leith was diversifying through going into various other children's services. Uh, other cases were looking at the uh, um, having uh, holiday clubs, uh, bringing in music, uh, music clubs uh, into, the, into the early years, diversifying that way. Then, as well as the sort of the quality and sort of the subject area being covered, there's also growth, sort of the in-house growth of existing sites where each one of them was uh, found to be trying to increase the number of users in each of their current sites as well, just to increase the scale that way. So just having more children being supported. We found that in two of the cases, the London Early Years Foundation and the, the fourth case, the private uh, nursery, um, they were starting new sites as a way of, uh, um, uh, of growing the organization. Um, and this is, um, and this we can distinguish between starting an absolutely new site in a new location, but also what we're finding a lot of organizations growing now through taking over or merging with other existing organizations. And this is the strategy that the London Early Years Foundation has found itself in. Almost uh, maybe to start with it was looking to grow in other ways, but it found that with a lot of nurseries struggling, uh, they could offer them uh, a way of continuing providing the support that was required by taking in a way, taking over uh, nurseries that weren't financially viable and keeping the service uh, going. So this is a, a form, and we see this across the social enterprise sector at the moment, many organizations, particularly in a, this period of austerity and uh, um, government cuts, uh, there have been a large number of uh, social enterprises that haven't been able to sustain themselves um, and um, uh, have found themselves uh, being able to continue the provision of the services maybe at a different scale, but by merging with another organization as well. So while some have declined, others, uh, others have grown. Um, and this is a, a, a way that you may see you know, throughout uh, as enterprises uh, in every country that uh, um, there is this process of merging uh, and organizations coming together. And sometimes you see it as an active um, strategy of social entrepreneurs that they may start, uh, start up an idea, develop it, and then once it has reached a level of maturity, it looked to, it, you know, to get that um, taken on by another organization 
uh, and then move on to the next uh, an, another idea. So this idea of uh, taking over organizations can be seen as very positive. It can be done from a position of strength as well as a position of, uh, sort of uh, financial uh, weakness as well. The other types of um, uh, growth we're seeing within organizations as well is the sort of winning of new contracts uh, for new sites. Um, and uh, for, particularly the London Early Years Foundation has found itself taking on and starting up new nurseries uh, where they win a contract from a local authority. Um, they actually have a, a nursery in the Houses of Parliament as well, so they won the contract to run that nursery as well. And a key part of that was demonstrating not only they were, were they a brilliant nursery, but also their wider social objectives as well. Um, and then we've got other areas here which, uh, of um, spin-out organizations um, where the, um, uh, particularly looking here at the, the fourth case where the organization, the, the founders of the organization had set up a, a separate uh, um, organization to run forest schools and do the training as well. So, and particularly this uh, having sort of an international uh, perspective as well. And this was done um, as a spin-out from that from the original organization. So again, another way of growing. Then there's other ways of growing, which I can talk about in a bit more detail, about the, sort of the replication and the scaling up outside of the, the organization. So this is, as I mentioned, you know, we covered the sort of the growth uh, within the organization. Um, but we can see here, within, within the growth strategy of any organization, there's real questions to be asked. What is the strategy? What's the best way of doing it? And I think um, the, uh, uh, we find that there's um, no sort of single best practice, and every organization has to think what's best in it for us. Just to start with, you've got a lot of organizations just operating at a niche. In, this, in these cases, they may be doing brilliant work um, and really focused with a very strong local um, connections. And in these cases, there's questions here about you know, should they be moving beyond that niche? Should they be growing? Um, and what's the best way of doing that? And then you have others move, who might be moving beyond the niche, but also moving to what I'd call a sort of a high growth state. And this might be the, uh, the approach of the London Early Years Foundation, who have moved from a, a more localized organization to, to something that's having uh, a much bigger remit across uh, a wide area of London um, and, and further. Um, and this way we can see uh, organizations really uh, going into a different a different approach but and I'll, I'll look at later is that to go down this route presents particular challenges and these organizations that are taking a high growth strategy really have to consider uh, all of the wider issues as well that they might be facing so here's some sort of examples of um, um, of some sort of these three different uh, approaches so a niche might be the little the nurseries I was just mentioning uh, before, but also something like uh, a small uh, um, one of the case studies we've used in some other work is the is corner plot doing organic produce in a box scheme, doing willows for basket making, um, and looking at environmental issues in the local area. But having a very localized impact, um, particularly working with volunteer opportunities as well, but really just looking to wanting to, to deliver a service and wanting to stay in that area. When we look at those which might be moving beyond, um, I might draw on another case study we've been working on of uh, Hill Holt Wood. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we've also got uh, the London Early Years Foundation. So when we look at the, sort of the ideas of attitudes to growth, I think there's an assumption sometimes that all social enterprises have to grow and they have to be looking to expand the number of people employed and the number of people working. But this is one of the case studies who actually challenged um, what they were doing, um, and they were sort of felt, they felt particularly here. If you read the, the quote here, um, people um, often commenting that it wasn't they weren't growing fast enough. But here they bring up this idea of prosperity without growth. So you can become an optimum size and remain so as a as a perfectly credible goal. So here they're uh, stating that really their best place to deliver their social impact at the scale they're doing and they don't have the aspiration to grow uh, much more, but want to have a wider impact uh, in different ways. I think it's really important to note that you know, uh, any organization can, um, uh, you know, can, 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 uh, can decide whether it wants to go for a larger um, 
a, you know, a larger scale of its own organization, or it can have uh, a sort of scale up in, uh, in different ways as well, beyond the organization. Hillholt Wood is a, another example of an organization that uh, can be seen to be in that sort of a middle category of uh, growth, of moving beyond a niche um, and um, having aspirations to grow, uh, but really keeping it focused on what uh, on a clear goal. So this is a 34-acre uh, wood that actually started up as a conservation um, uh, project um, with the two founders, who um, uh, uh, Nigel and Karen. Uh, and they wanted to um, uh, look at preserve their, preserving their wood, but they also moved into uh, employment and education roles as well. So through having the woodland area, they then started offering support for those uh, uh, children excluded from schools and started getting contracts to deliver um, uh, that sort of education services. And then coming out of that, they started uh, with the ranges that they had and the people they had involved in the, in the wood. They then started getting contracts to do more countryside management work uh, in the surrounding areas. Um, so they have this sort of diverse uh, range of learners. Um, and it's shown to have a very wide impact both in terms of the sort of conservation, but also in the education and in terms of antisocial behavior. Uh, and now they're looking to diversify as well. So they're following a number of these in these sort of growth strategies uh, of, uh, of growing in different ways. Um, but now they're di diversifying into eco-design and building as well as a, a, a further interest of this. So here we can see these two, um, we, we can see that there the, these um, organizations are looking to grow within the organization. What I want to go on to next is this idea of scaling up through formalized relationships with other providers um, and sort of replication of, uh, uh, through various collaborative approaches such as social franchising and social licensing. And through these we can see increasing potential and scale of the impact uh, and of the innovations uh, through reaching out to these wider groups. So in these formalized replication models, the most common one we hear a lot about is the idea of social franchising. There's actually very uh, few examples of, of this idea of franchising. It's the idea of taking a model uh, that you find throughout the commercial sector of uh, re uh, replicating a proven business model. So the classic example is, is the McDonald's model uh, where you have franchise, um, franchisees delivering the uh, um, the restaurants uh, to a very clear uh, contract and very clear specification as well. So in a social franchise, you, you have a fee from the franchisee to the franchisor. So the organization setting up the franchise will then charge a fee to those organi independent organizations that are delivering the service. And then they will um, use the same, um, uh, uh, a lot of the same branding and the same standards uh, to deliver the service as well. And this is something we've looked at for a number of organizations, but there's real challenges here in terms of having this legal contract to ensure that the brand uh, standards are, are maintained. And what we're finding in many cases where people start going down it, they really struggle to keep uh, that, to ensure those brand standards. And they're not really willing to enforce such, uh, in such a rigorous way that you might find in the commercial sector, particularly in the social sector. So this is where we make a distinction between that sort of uh, that type of franchising and what we might call social licensing. And this is where you might have a form of replication, but you have a formal agreement but fewer obligations. So you, examples here include uh, organisations offering uh, training uh, and other types of support, uh, and they might give their training materials and their branding um, uh, to other organisations, and then they to provide training, to you know, train the other trainers who are in these other organizations being done. And the key element within the social licensing is this idea of, uh, of trust. Um, it's hard to sort of enforce it, but uh, um, there's a way of keeping that relationship going. And also in the social licensing, we're finding organizations can help uh, the sort of the franchisor, the, the, the origin, originating organization, can help with the development side of it. Um, and you might have an example here is something like um, uh, um, the Green Gym movement uh, where the uh, um, BTCV, the British Trust uh, 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 Conservation Volunteers, set up a, uh, an approach of encouraging uh, 
physical exercise with conservation activity. And they developed the model, and then they've had it licensed to be used uh, in a large number of other organizations, both within other larger organizations, but also new startup organizations themselves. And they pay a, a small fee to cover some of the costs of doing it. Um, and they also get support in the training and building up of the support to, to do it. But each one of those franchisees is an enterprise in itself and has to be run on that commercial basis. The other way we find is the idea of kite marks and uh, quality standards. Uh, and you can see this across a, a range of areas where an organization has a particular standard, then they can set it up and those other organizations can then use that uh, standard um, uh, in terms of sort of uh, getting uh, getting some benefit as, uh, as well. So these are the sort of the more formalized replication models. We also have noticed some other types of, of social enterprises trying to uh, replicate through having um, a uh, uh, supporting other organizations through training as well as um, uh, providing support for setting up new organizations. This is a the less formalized side, but it's probably one where we find a lot more uh, impact as well. And this can be, uh, there is a sort of, it is formalized and there might be a contract um, and there might be some intellectual property uh, agreements that might be signed, um, but the organization receiving the support might pay a, a one-off fee for that training. And this is the model which the uh, Hill Holt Wood have used, where they've gone to work with other uh, environmental organizations looking to link the education with the, uh, with the conservation. And they've been offering training and the support of the management systems uh, and various other systems uh, that organizations need to get involved in this sort of area. We also see it with the London Early Years Foundation where they're offering support uh, for other organizations and uh, are giving them um, uh, training in early years provision as well. But this leads us to the third area of having an impact, um, which is open access sharing and disseminating good practice. So really, I think what we can find, one of the ways of having a very big impact and uh, scaling uh, things um, to a wider audience is by making it available, letting other people know, and encouraging other people to copy. And this is one of the hardest areas within um, social enterprises, where you have um, um, uh, so it's a wide areas within social enterprises where there is a sort of tension between having intellectual property and sort of maintaining your competitive advantage and ensuring that a private company or another social enterprise doesn't come along and take away the work that would keep you uh, uh, in, in operation. With the other side of it is having that bigger social impact of making sure people know about the great work you're doing and using your model elsewhere. And this is something that uh, social enterprises face. It's a particular example of a tension, which I'll talk about at the end, between the social objective and the commercial objectives. And it's something that has to be faced every day, really, uh, in, in many of the different, it's one of the, the classic distinctions of a social enterprise from uh, other types of organizations. What we also see here is this sort of decreasing control about how innovations are, are implemented as well. So if you have developed some ideas, if you've got growth within the organization, you've got complete control within the organization, or not complete control, but a large degree of control. If you're going through scaling through formalized relationships and social franchises and licensing, again, you've got a degree of control uh, over how other organizations use your innovations or use your branding and use your, uh, your ideas. Um, but the, in the, sort of the open access and sharing, you have the least control, and organizations can take what you have done, uh, they can uh, use it, develop it, often for very positive uh, reasons, but also there's a risk there of people taking an idea, using it in a different way, and uh, devaluing and confusing them, um, uh, what's actually being provided. Um, so you might have that with, for example, an early years type of provision where you might have a private company claiming, uh, or, or an organization claiming to deliver in a particular way, um, but it's very hard to enforce whether they are actually up to the standards uh, required. So we can look at the uh, capabilities required for, for, for the different strategies, and I'll go through each one of those, uh, each of the strategies I've mentioned before in turn. So here we have the sort of the different um, the different strategies required. And I think here, when we're looking here, we want to look at when I talk here about the capabilities. It's looking at every organisation has to find ways of 
uh, delivering um, what it does um, and delivering with internal skills. So it's not just about the training and the skills, it's about the approach taken and the ethos as well. So in terms of maximizing social impact, the, the key thing here is the, the sort of the leadership and the management of the organization, um, having those capabilities as well as the skills of the staff uh, and the uh, sort of uh, involved. There's also an element here around um, what we might call, um, uh, particularly around maximizing social impact in a chain, in, in, as the world changes around you, there's a need to innovate, to do things differently. Um, I think this will be a topic we'll, I guess we covered in a later uh, talk in this uh, webinar series. Um, but in terms of sort of innovation, there's a real skill there in terms of those capabilities of learning. Uh, as well as uh, capabilities of identifying new solutions and new ways of doing things. So there is this need for um, leadership and management. We can call that as well, uh, in its sort of, a, uh, uh, a sort of technical term, might be uh, the dynamic capabilities. How do you actually understand the, the changing world around you? How do you respond to that? Uh, and how are you able to sort of support that? Then there's... Um, uh, secondly, when you're looking at sort of diversification, again, there's a, that need for innovation, um, but also there's a need for skills in terms of building re uh, uh, relationships, and also what we call sort of opportunity recognition. And in each of the cases I've mentioned, they're uh, particularly um, looking at uh, like Hill Holt Wood, they had real um, uh, skills in diversifying, but based on these relationships and identifying new opportunities. So in Hill Holt Wood's uh, example, they had the opportunity recognition of linking conservation with education. And then they've moved through the opportunity recognition to move into the public, um, into the delivering public services, getting contracts from the local authority. And particularly, they found really important relationships, as I'll mention later, with, with particular areas of the local authority. And in terms of in-house growth of existing organizations, we hear, as well as those previous capabilities, we've got key issues here around the marketing, uh, or fundraising if you're going for grant funding, uh, but particularly, particularly how do you scale up your number of customers, how do you get reach, uh, have, a, have, a, have a, a wider reach, how do you get different people to come in, how do you look, you know, how do you price the services that you are doing so that you both maximize uh, access but also maximize the surplus that you might generate that can then be reinvested for other social benefits as well. In terms of starting new sites, we found the capabilities here. Again, there's management issues, um, uh, but particularly around how do organizations grow. And particularly, there's a big shift from a single site up to multiple sites. Um, and how do you have a centralized support? What sort of, particularly if you're working over a different geographic area, how do you manage those, uh, you know, managing over a distance? How do you appoint the right people to, 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 to lead in di these different sites? And then also, what sort of, how do you ensure that your quality, uh, what are your quality systems uh, that are there to ensure that you've got that across all organizations as well? And we find that these sort of issues are particularly important when you're taking over existing organizations. Because uh, here you'll be taking over new staff who have come from a previous organization, come with a very different work culture. And this is what uh, the London Early Years Foundation has been very successful in, in coping with these um, uh, different work environments, different work cultures, bringing people together. Um, and they have to um, spend, they allocate a huge amount of their uh, efforts at the beginning of their work, um, of working with a new nursery, of, of, of working with the culture, of uh, building up uh, a common culture with the rest of the organization. Um, but also looking at, um, you know, often these organizations, uh, when taking on an, an existing organization, that uh, hasn't been financially successful, there may be underlying reasons behind that that have to be addressed and hard decisions uh, to be made there. But really keeping the sort of beneficiaries in mind, what's the best way of, of keeping the organization going? Then there's looking at new contracts for new sites as well. Uh, here we're finding that sort of the bid writing skills and the capacity to invest the time in bid writing has been crucial. Um, so those bid writing capabilities, we find that in the London Early Years Foundation, you see it in other, any other organization going for big contracts, not just with the public sector, but those offering to the private sector as well. And then we've got the spin-out organizations, uh, those, organ those uh, areas uh, where 
a, uh, an existing social enterprise is spinning out. There we have the key issues here is looking at the market research and business planning for those new organizations to make them uh, are viable uh, themselves. So these are the range of capabilities for growing within the organization. So let's just look here in detail about the London Early Years Foundation. So they built um, relationships with local authorities, going for new and jointly provide services. So they're looking across a number of boroughs in London. Often it's a sort of a challenging relationships there as well as the both trying to win new uh, work but also persuade and uh, influence the uh, local authorities of the importance of early years more generally. They've also worked very hard at marketing and building relationships with parents uh, and also looking at particularly what is the offer that they can offer um, uh, to ensure that they can attract a wide range of parents, both those uh, um, uh, who pay the full fees um, and those uh, who um, from lower income uh, groups who might be needing support as well. Uh, to, so really looking what are the ways to maximize their social, uh, social benefit. But having that surplus uh, is a crucial area um, of, of ensuring that that can then be redistributed as well. And then there's the relationships that they have uh, with other nurseries. And they're often seen as a place to go to for organizations uh, or nurseries when they're struggling they're often asking uh, uh, London Early Years Foundation for advice on what to do and also looking particularly where you've got a single site uh, like parent um, run uh, a nursery that can often struggle, doesn't have the management uh, in place and is reliant on volunteer uh, directors or trustees. Uh, there are often organizations that then need, um, you know, who, who, who might be at threat of closure and then looking to get the support of uh, London Early Years Foundation. So their, their ability to reach out to understand these other organizations and see what's happening has been, has been crucial in their growth. So taking Hill Holt Wood, I mentioned before, the importance of their um, uh, strategic relationships as well. So they've got relationships with uh, local authorities, uh, with government agencies, um, and then they're providing better services, um, but also um, showing that they can uh, they can demonstrate that value to others as well. And they've put a lot of effort into um, networking with, with elected councillors as well, of getting them to sort of push, uh, um, uh, uh, to sort of make sure that the issue of conservation and education is high up in the agenda as well. So we can also look at the, uh, these other areas of, of, sort of social franchising. Again, there's capabilities required here. Um, needing to have clear procedures, particularly for a social franchise and licensing, having these clear procedures and the, uh, the ability to monitor franchisees, franchisees as well. But the key issue we found, and we went through uh, a number of organizations looking at the social franchise model. And actually, not, while very few of them have gone down that route, what they have done is set out their procedures very clearly. And that's helped them grow in other areas as well. So quite often we're finding that a lot of the uh, in a social franchise, what makes the original organization work is stuff that's often held in people's heads uh, and it's in the culture as well. And that has to be, if you're going to spread that, sometimes that has to be more systematized or formalized in a, uh, or written down so it then can be shared with others. And that's a real challenge. How do you transfer some of that to other organizations? And in these other areas as well of having a scale beyond the organization through having open access and uh, um, sharing the idea. It's all about other, other capabilities again are required, both in terms of training and marketing skills for running training courses, being able to network, um, and then being able to sort of, one of the key issues here is the sort of, you know, the decision about do you provide open source material or not? Do you have the ability and the capability to uh, invest the time um, without the financial return? So finally, I want to quickly skip over some of the um, uh, um, tensions arising from scaling and what can be done to do that. So I know looking at time, I'll, um, I'll skip through this quite quickly. There is more detail. People are interested in this on a, uh, um, a paper we've just had come out um, with myself. And this is some work with um, um, Bob Doherty and uh, Helen Hall, um, who have uh, um, looking at some of the different tensions that we're having. The crucial one here is the challenge to the social mission of any organization that's growing. 
So you've got what we could call here the different logics, the logic of the social mission and the, the business logic of making money. And social enterprises, as I mentioned, have to do that always. So there's always these competing demands and these tensions. Um, and what we can hear, it, what, what we can see sometimes in organizations that grow is that you might, what some people refer to as mission drift, that they drift away from their social objective to their commercial objective and as the organization grows. It's a real challenge in keeping really focused on that social benefit. And here we find various tra uh, trade-offs as well. Do you sacrifice social value for the economic capture or do you actually go for a strategy of not seeking profit maximization to maximize the social benefit? And you can see management practices there of, uh, uh, of finding ways uh, of balancing these two. But it's, within any social enterprise, you're constantly having to sort of make these decisions. There's issues here about uh, getting the financial resource mobilization, and I know there's an, another talk uh, that I'm giving in a few weeks' time about social investment, so I'll skip over some of these issues here, but uh, um, the key thing here is how do you get access to finance uh, um, to, to allow the growth to happen, and the particular issues for social enterprise. And finally, there's the issue here of, uh, of managing people. And we've got um, challenges here in terms of um, whether the extent to which salaries are constrained by the financial position of organizations, um, and particularly skills and the lack of skills in this uh, combining the social and commercial objectives. Um, so how do you get those sort of people in the organization? And then how do you, you um, keep them as well? And the third challenge really is around the role of volunteers. As many social enterprises can add the extra value through using volunteers, and it's a crucial way of uh, offering this wider social benefit. But how do you attract and retain them as well? So in each of these challenges, we find tensions, um, particularly when looking at volunteers. There's particular tensions there, um, as they might be managed differently to organizations. But the volunteers are across the organization, and particularly when you're looking at volunteer board members. Uh, how do you um, keep those people um, engaged? How do you how do organizations um, retain board members and also have board members with a commercial expertise that allows them to mix both the social and the commercial objective. And many organizations, uh, they may have um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the leaders within the organization might have ambitions to grow, but some of the trustees or the directors of the company may be more cautious, uh, which can be a, a, an important issue in the org, uh, ensuring accountability in the organization, but can also hold back. Uh, organizations having a bigger impact here. So there's real issues here about how do you um, balance the, um, the, so the social and the commercial uh, in terms of managing people as well. So to conclude, um, we've got here of the idea of scaling it's a, and uh, growing a social enterprise is something that we hear a lot about uh, in the um, uh, in the press and a lot of interest in how do we get these great things that are happening happening on a wider scale um, and particularly this is happening in a we're going to look at this in this period of, uh, of rapid change not only are we finding new social problems changing demographics creating new uh, new issues but also the period of austerity with a large proportion of social enterprises reliant on uh, public sector funding um, what's happening to them some of them are growing because there's more opportunities uh, with, a, uh, with, with more services being outsourced from, uh, and contracted out of government, but also other organizations struggling as their existing uh, income sources are cut back. Um, but there is this continued interest in government. Uh, there's also increased opportunities from consumer markets and business supply chains, so like the work that's happening at the uh, Social Enterprise UK of promoting the supply chains. Um, again, we're looking at those, what are those interesting opportunities of growth that way. But in each of these strategies, whether it's growing within the organization or licensing and franchising or, or sort of sharing more broadly, there are different strategies and capabilities. So every organization has to think, what are our strengths? What capabilities do we have? Um, and what are the ways, you know, what, what do we need to fill the capabilities we have so we can grow and have our maximum uh, social impact? And the challenge is here is, is that these strategies is not just within the organization and really Every organization has to think, what's our best way of maximizing the social value, both through growing the organization uh, and allowing the ideas that you might be developing to grow elsewhere. So 
So thank you very much. That, uh, I'll welcome any of your questions and comments. Great. Thank you, Fergus. That, that was really, really interesting. Um, so if anybody's got any questions and they'd like to tap them in the box, we can do a bit of a Q&A for the next few minutes. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of minutes to type anything in. Just to remind you, we have recorded this webinar, so I'll be able to send the link to you later along with the slides um, so that you can obviously listen again and, and share it um, with, with any colleagues or, or people in your network. Um, as Fergus mentioned, um, he's actually will be facilitating our next webinar, which is in a couple of weeks. It's on Wednesday, the 4th of June at 12 o'clock. Um, and that webinar will be all about the demand for social investment and loan finance, um, which I think is a great follow-on and a fit to today's webinar. So I'll send you the registration link for that as well if people want to listen to that. Um, so I'm just seeing if there are any questions. Nothing's popping up immediately, so I'll just give you a couple of minutes. If any questions arise after today, um, when we finish the webinar, you can always pop them in an email to me. Um, and I can forward them to Fergus um, for any particular burning questions that you have. Um, yeah, so it doesn't appear there's any immediate questions right now. Um, so like I said, please do drop me an email if you have any questions and we will share uh, the, the recording and, and the slides with you. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you, Fergus, for, your, for delivering today's webinar. Um, it was really interesting um, and uh, hopefully people have got a lot out of it. Um, so as there's no questions, we will end it here. So I wish you all a good Friday and uh, a nice weekend and hope you can join us for the next webinar. So thanks again, Fergus, and, um, and we'll see everybody again soon. Thank you. Thank you.